Thanks to Columbia, the prior speakers. Thanks to all of you. It's it's really a pleasure. We're too isolated, and it's fun to see you. So um, I'm going to take you to Thwaites Glacier, but not really. I have not been to Thwaites. Here's Sridhar and one of his explorations at Thwaites. Some of the people that I'll be relying on. Um, here's our current crop of grad students. Uh, Lizzie made it to Thwaites. The rest of them haven't because COVID shut down the field. Um, here's some of the other people that will be there, Shuji and Luke, who are over in geography. I'll be leaning a bit on Dave Pollard, Byron Perzak. A lot of the field work was done by Don Voigt. What I'm going to show you is not me. It's a fantastic group. I especially rely on work by Sridhar. He's a Columbia grad who then worked at Wisconsin and then has been a, a star with us for a very long time. Okay, so what I'm going to tell you, more or less, I hope, is something that you probably all know. I don't have to tell you anymore, but um, if you have to leave early, sea level rise is almost guaranteed, and it really could be a lot larger than is generally projected because of well-known, long-observed, hard-to-model processes. And you will see the, oh, we have to add new physics. No, we don't. We knew this decades ago. It's hard. It's really difficult. But it's stuff that's almost always admit, omitted from the big models. And this gives us a real challenge in how to communicate things. So that's where we're going to go. Um, I'll start with the, the requisite background. You've probably seen all of this about 10 times, but, but we'll get up to speed on this. Here's the altimetry. You show a plot like this, and the work and the science that's behind this is just flabbergasting. But yes, sea level is rising at an accelerating rate. OK, and I can tell you, you know, I drew a little yellow blurb right there. Back in 2008, there was a piece in The Guardian that said, oh, look, sea level is falling. Why are you people not telling us the good news? And then they shut up. I spent a lot of time answering US government persons at that next one. And then they shut up. And then they came. Yeah. These are El Nino's sloshing water onto and off of the land surface. Yes, sea level is rising. <laughs> um, it's having an influence. So this is not entirely the global signal. There's some local signal in South Florida, but, but it is the global signal. This is not a canal, it's a street. You can see where the pickup truck driveway is. This is not a storm, it's a high tide. This is adaptation. This is nuisance flooding. This is nuisance flood. I swipe these pictures and the, the sources are down there. This is nuisance flooding. But you know the story, which is at some point, nuisance becomes expensive. And so in general, it is pretty clear that the cost function is steeper than linear. And it might be a lot steeper deeper than linear. And so a little more sea level rise can have a lot more impact. We're going to talk about a lot more sea level rise, but, but recognize this function means that the long tail is immediately important. This is Hurricane Gustav that did not get into New Orleans. We are pretty well committed to sea level rise that would require an engineering solution to keep this storm out of the city in our lifetime. But we're talking today about something that might disappear out of the top of the picture. So that's that's what I want to want to work on. Okay. Go back to the data, squeeze them down. They're more or less in, in this picture right here. Um, IPCC, great work, great graphics, add on some history. Yes, sea level rise has accelerated. Add on some possible futures. Um, you know, we're committed to sea level rise. There's nothing we can do about that right now. But human decisions become dominant by the time today's students are old. And again, the uncertainties are heavily weighted to going off the top of this page and perhaps way off the top of this page. Why is it rising? You all know this as well as I do. What's fantastic is that we're reaching the point now that you can sort of do the balance and the changes in it on year to year basis. You can say Greenland was this much this year and it was that much that year. You can, it's amazing what's been done. But very crudely, ocean water expansion as it warms is important. 
mountain glaciers melting are important. The ice sheets are important, but it's mostly melting of Greenland. And the parts that I'm really interested in, it, in our research, it's all interesting, but in our research, the parts that are most consuming for us are not doing much to sea level right now. It's mostly surface mass balance, mountain glaciers, ocean, and a little bit of reservoirs versus groundwater mining. And that sort of changes with what we do. If that balance remains important, sea level rise has been small, we are smiling, the costs are not through the roof. As long as that balance is important, it's not that bad. If that balance fails to be important, then the ice sheets are playing and it's bad, okay? Mountain glaciers, maybe a third of a meter and they're gone. Ocean expansion, it depends on where you put the heat, but sort of a third to a half a meter per degree. We're only about two degrees above the ice age right now. It's hard to raise the ocean a huge amount in a hurry. Greenland, probably 7.4 meters, uh, Antarctica, a whole lot more than that. And so realistically, the only way to get large sea level rise is to do it from the ice sheets. And the only way to get large fast sea level rise is to do it by flow of the ice sheets, which is not yet doing much. The IPCC, strong warming, 2100, more than 99% of the ice sheet sea level equivalent remains in the ice sheets. The, the worst case to 2100 under the IPCC quantified, more than 99% of the ice sheets remains intact. That sets the error structure. It's really hard to be a lot better than that. It's really easy to be a lot worse than that. And so that's, that's where we're going, right? So, so, and the research agenda on expanding oceans, on melting on top of Greenland and Antarctica, on snowing on top of Greenland, they are just moving forward brilliantly. They're learning, they're reducing the uncertainties. The uncertainties are quantified. The way the ice responds to that is in pretty good shape um, because there's been this immense amount of progress. They know where you can put money to reduce those uncertainties. If you give them money, they will reduce those uncertainties, but they're, the uncertainties are smaller than the signal already. They're, they're in, in amazing shape there. Cold ice flowing or breaking into the ocean, we're not that good, not even close, okay? So I'm gonna do a little history. The, the title is, this is old stuff that we have to get better on. So I'm old, I've been at this. So I started working for Ian Willens right here, um, summer of 77. I was just after my fresh person year. I went to Antarctica first with David Elliott, uh, Doyle Watts, Tom Groshen, and was, it was a grad student. I'm an undergrad in 78. At that time, interest in West Antarctic collapse was old hat at Ohio State. They had been doing it for a while. They were up on it. It was the Institute of Polar Studies, which is now the Bird Center, but this was old hat. That's me sitting there working on NSF Spry TUD radar of the bird station strain net. We are trying to work out history of stability of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Ian is trying to work that out. I'm a flunky, I'm drawing lines. But, um, but at any rate, um, so this idea that, that something could happen that would be big was old hat in, in 77 when I got there, right? I go up to work with Charlie Bentley. This is Charlie Bentley over here at the end of the arrow in the IGY. Those of you, who were at Columbia or in the area, right? Charlie's a graduate. He graduates from Columbia. Well, he didn't graduate from Columbia in 57. He defended his thesis successfully. He grabs the train the next day. He goes to Panama. He catches the ship to Antarctica at the canal. He goes to Antarctica. He spends a summer, a winter, a summer, a winter, and a summer before he comes home. So two and a half years in the Antarctic. He comes home and he still had not graduated because Columbia wouldn't pay his friggin' $50 thesis fee. Okay, <laughs> Columbia has standards. So at any rate, 
<laughs> this is all true. Okay. Um, it's just truly really amazing, right? So, so there's Charlie. And the interest in West Antarctic collapse comes from Charlie. So he goes out with seismics and he's expecting to find Australia with a little ice on top. He finds the Bentley Trench and the Bird Basin. So what should have been a continent with a little skim of ice turns out to be these vast deep basins that could very easily be ocean. He is thinking about how easily could it be ocean. Gordon Robin is thinking about it. Uh, John Mercer is at Ohio State by 68. John Mercer puts together that the Emian sea level highs look like the West Antarctic volume. Uh, by 74, Weirtman has his instability of the junction of an ice shelf and, and an ice stream, and we've got a potential instability. And then we've got all these other people who are working on fast moving tidewater glaciers. Ice can go fast, it can break. They're working on surging glaciers, ice can go faster. So that was sort of the state of knowledge when I first get into it, and I get to work with the people who were doing it, which was just amazing. How much we didn't know. So our beds were still bedrock with cubes on them, Weirtman tombstones. We didn't know much about ice streams and their shear margins. We didn't know how rapidly they could respond inland. This was all to come. We're just learning that ice streams are there, basically. Ian had this idea that longitudinal stress gradients would matter in ice streams. So he had me build what you might now call a higher order ice flow model. It was sort of kludge together. It was, I it's computer cards and I carry it around in a box under my arm. I'm supposed to solve ice streams with this. I failed miserably. I couldn't make any progress. Fortunately, Ian goes on sabbatical to, to Grenoble with Dominic Grenoble. Uh, John Bolzen helps me and we repurpose this thing and we do the response of East Antarctica over thousands of years to sea level rise. Ian comes back and he says there's been a palace revolt, but he signed the thesis, so we were okay, um, right? So, so uh, ice streams, well, how do we know what an ice stream is? This is a map of the Seipel Coast ice stream. Sion Shabtai is doing this with a radar and a twin otter. And he's got, you know, inertial navigation. He's got pressure altimetry. And how do you find an ice stream when you fly over the margin, the radar gets scruffy. And that's because it's scattering off of the crevasses. And then he makes a little mark. And when he has a whole bunch of marks, he connects the things together. And if he'd had one lousy satellite image, he'd have saved a year of his life. Um, you know, this was the level of how do we try to learn these things. Um, the bed of these ice streams is not in general bedrock with cubes on it. Um, a lot of it is soft sediment, it's tell. Don Blankenship discovered that with just this amazing amount of brilliance and with generating digital techniques for Antarctica for the first time. And he had the, the Powell and Ben Abernathy, he had to develop all these digital techniques. And then he had to convince Charlie because at that time, paying grad students to pick seismic records was cheap. And the storage media for this plot cost more than a grad student. It was unbelievable. That was the big cost was the storage media so that you can make a plot that said, wow, there's a layer at the bottom of the ice stream that's really soft that's lubricating the flow. We had these arguments. So, so getting from the coast inland took thousands of years to get all the way to the center. Could it get part way faster? And we're arguing about this. And then Sridhar goes down and the tide changes and the ice is responding almost 100 kilometers inland in half a day. And we said, yes, it can get inland fast. That's, a, that's just all right, okay? So, so, you know, the learning has just been truly amazing, just truly uh, unbelievable. Um, and so where, where we are, 
It's remote sensing, it is field work, field work in the air, field work at the surface, field work through the ice, field work in what's under the ice, field work in what's way under the ice, field work in what's around the ice in the ocean. It is model development for all of those. It is determining the history for validation. It is lab experiments for calibration. And there's some more on there and pilots and, and mountaineers and you know those funding agencies and so on. But we're still, essentially where we were when I walked into Ian's office as a scared undergrad, which is that a large change in the ice sheet rapidly is still consistent with current knowledge. It's really hard to model and it may not happen. And that basic picture is known at a very much higher level than it was 44 years ago, but it hasn't changed. All right, so there's a lot of ways this could happen. Any good engineer will tell you there's essentially an unlimited number of failure modes for a system. But the two that are most likely, we now do know, and that would be ice shelf loss and then calving cliff retreat. Both of these are well known. We've observed them for a long time. Neither can be modeled well for really good, well understood reasons. Okay, so. We'll go here, uh, marine ending ice tends to stabilize just past a bottleneck. It, it's like a military reinforcing a high ground. It, it, it gets to a place that it can hang on for ice flow reasons. This may be a narrowing, it may be a bump in the bed, and, you know, something like that. Um, then there's a whole bunch of things that, that keep it there. And not just ice flow, but also sedimentation and self-gravitational effects on the ocean and isostasy. It's hard to kick ice out. So normally, when you look at ice, it's sitting pretty much where it's been for a while. And it makes big moraines, and you can tell where it was. It makes it right. If you succeed in kicking it out, despite all these stabilizers, it tends to proceed rapidly to the next bottleneck. Normally it's in one narrow fjord or some little weeny place or the, or the next bottleneck is close. It can be locally spectacular. It is globally insignificant. The thing about Bentley and what got this going is the exact same processes if they happen in West Antarctica are globally significant. It's not that it's different physics. It's that it's a different setting. And that Bentley Trench in the Bird Basin is the problem. So this one, Mathieu is on here, a great paper they just submitted to, to the cryosphere. And I swiped this and thank you. Uh, what do they got? There's a glacier flowing in from the left, the Tidewater Glacier. Um, and they're looking at how it interacts with, they have a bottleneck and an embayment and a depression. And I sort of kind of called all these bottlenecks, but each of these is a year where the thing ends. And what does it do? It hangs up out here and then it jumps back to here and then it hangs up and it hangs up and it hangs up and then it jumps back. It hangs up and it hangs up and then it jumps back. It hangs up and it hangs up and then it jumps back. This is how glaciers act. It's a beautiful work, right? This is our version of this um, from a long time ago, 2007. Sridhar was observing the sedimentation under the Ross ice shelf. And then we asked, does this matter? And so we put together a lot of different models and Byron and Dave and Todd DuPont. And all of these, this is sort of air over ice over rock. And um, so what I'm gonna do is make a retreat. The top one is smooth, it's boring. The bottom one, what does it do? It jumps to the bump, right? Now it's on the bottleneck. It's hanging on, it's hanging on, it's hanging on, it's hanging on. Oh crap, it's gone, okay? This is, and this was not new when we did it. It was sort of fun. Um, Sridhar's data were new, they were really brilliant. Um, we looked at how do you drive these retreats? That was sea level rise. I drove it with sea level rise. Linkages between north and south are probably important. Um, but what we found was far and away the easiest way is to change the ice shelf. So if you have an ice shelf and you can kick that off, that's the easiest way to kick the ice. It is not the only one, but it's the easiest one. 
So let's take this to Antarctica. Reds are thinning, blues are thickening. Thwaites Glacier is this thing over here. That's where we're gonna go. Bentley had these few seismic lines, a point here and a point there along these few lines. And he found the trench and the trough, you know, the basin. This is what it looks like now, bed map two, an immense amount of radar and some seismics. And, and now you have, you know, Matthew can do this and others can, can do these, these mass conserving beds. And oh, it's just wonderful what has been done. Um, the dark blue is 2,500 meters below sea level. It's got 4,000 meters of ice in it, so it's, it can raise sea level. But the dark blue is 2,500 meters below sea level. That just just truly amazed. That's what Bentley found. This is the old West Antarctic rift system. This is a rift flank. This is the other rift flank over here. The ice really wants to flow along the tectonic fabric out the ends, but it's really far out the ends. And so the ice is built up in the middle. And when it got high in the middle, it found a leak. And so Thwaites is just a leak through the rift flank of the high ice in the middle of the, the rift system, okay? And so there's a real bottleneck here. You go from 2,500 meters to less than 500. You go from a lot of hundreds of kilometers to 100. It's a big bottleneck, really big bottleneck from a big hole. If you kick it out of there, it, it'll try to hang up in a few places right over here. And then the next stopping point is the Transantarctics. And that's why it's important is that you can't stop it out here in the middle in 2,500 meters. It is, it's really hard to do. You'd need a huge, really influential ice shelf to do that. Here's a possible analogy, but this isn't bad enough because Thwaites is, is funneling vertically. It would be, if we had four or five different levels, as well as a whole lot of lanes pulling together, that would be Thwaites. It funnels vertically, it funnels horizontally into the bottleneck. It's a big backup, all right? So nothing new there, nothing new. Uh, if you were to make Thwaites retreat, right? so, so Ted Pfeffer ages ago says, look, if Thwaites doesn't retreat, you can't raise sea level a lot from there because you can't put that much ice through the bottleneck. You can't, but if it retreats, you can make it a few times thicker you can make it a few times longer. And then you don't even have to accelerate to make a difference to sea level projections. It will accelerate with very high confidence and I'll show you that in a minute. But, um, but it's just getting out of the bottleneck if you drive retreat that matters. This is a little model from, from Robin uh, Pollard and DeCanto and DeCanto and Pollard and what have you. At present, Thwaites is pushing out through fairly narrow places and these light colors mean that it's not very deep. If you retreat a little, it's pushing out through a very much wider front and these darker colors mean it's deeper. More times more, probably going faster, a lot more discharge sea level rise, okay? We knew, as I said, you know, Bob Thomas, Charlie Bentley, the Ross Ice Shelf Project. I worked with Ken Jenning, Ken Jezik about using the height of basal crevasses to get the back stress on the ice shelf to get the flow law of ice back in 85. Um, but now you have this, right? So first at all, this is just brilliant. And so everything in color is an ice shelf. The darkest blue, is the ice shelf is not holding anything back. All the other colors, there's at least some back stress from the ice shelf and all the yellower ones, there's a lot of back stress. Right? So one thing comes out of this, when you get to be freely spreading, you break off in a hurry. There isn't much freely spreading ice shelf, it's unstable, it goes. Um, the ice, Shelves are holding back the ice sheet. It keeps the ice sheet bigger and the ocean smaller. The ice shelves are holding themselves up because when they become unbuttressed, they break off. And exactly how there's some basis in Walker and Parazak and what have you, but that's, that's still Doug Ban. There's still work being done on that. But the ice shelves matter to themselves and to the ice sheet. And that's all in that picture. How do you lose an ice shelf? Well, there's two 
basic things that we've observed. As I said, there's probably a whole range of possible failure mechanisms, but there's two that have been well observed. And we'll do the first one, which is the Larsen B, meltwater wedging. Then I'll come back and do the Jakobshafen, which is melting below David Holland's work in others. So um, the Larsen B, what happens, you get meltwater on top, it gets in the cracks, the front falls off, and then the next one, and then the next one, and it's uh, retrogressive. Uh, once it gets past Doak's compressive arch, it just keeps going. The Larsen B, it sort of kind of went at 10 kilometers a week. Um, Jakob Savin, we'll come back to it in a minute. So we'll do the Larsen B. I'm sure you've seen this in 10 of these talks already, but we go up there to the peninsula in the little magenta box. Uh, this is the little magenta box, ocean in black, ice shelf is in here. Um, and then you've got um, tributary glaciers. There's a scale bar there on the right. Um, slightly rotated, same thing. Bef while the Larsen B was still there, Doak et al. in Nature in 98 said, well, look, there's a big iceberg about to break off. It doesn't matter. It's sort of blue in that first et al. plot. But he said, if you start breaking into the yellow in that plot, it'll keep going. Okay, So there was a prediction that if it once breaks into that, it will keep going, that Doak et al. made in 98. Um, here we're back again. Water is the blue on top, sitting in crevasses and lakes and things. And that big iceberg is long gone. And then what happens is this. All right. So five weeks of you know 50k sort of kind of um, it fell apart. No direct sea level rise from that. Gets out of the way, and then the tributaries speed up a good bit. So um, you do get a little sea level rise, not much because there just isn't much ice behind it. But so there is a way to get rid of an ice shelf, wedge it on top, drive it back. It, you know, so Doug McHale and Pat Scambos and, and Mark Fonestai, a whole bunch of great people have worked on this, made a lot of progress. Um, uh, you know, Alex Robel more recently and others. Um, this is a really complicated issue. Um, how much melt we will get. Will the melt infiltrate in the fern or will it make the fern impermeable by making little layers up in the top? Will streams run off and carry the water away and save the ice shelves or will they go down holes and moulins and, and save the ice shelf or will they break it apart? Um, how resistant is it to toppling and what's going on on the sides? You know, this is a really challenging topic, but it's very easy to see it works, put melt water in. And it'll fall apart. Okay. There's a second mechanism that we've observed, and like I say, probably others. Um, it may have contributed at Larsen B. So the ocean warmed, the ice shelf thinned before it fell apart from the front. And so we're going to go up here to Jakob Savin. Dave Holland signed in there. He did this brilliant work, just unbelievable how much good stuff he's done. Um, there's an ice shelf at Jakob Savin. The ocean warmed a degree because of, of changes in circulation and winds. Puts warm water underneath. The ice shelf broke off. This was probably the world's fastest glacier, and it almost tripled its speed. So this is from Ian Jockin's paper, um, and that was a, a very interesting thing. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll put it here and sort of building on um, David's work. And so this is perhaps the world's largest faster glacier. The water warms, the ice shelf thins, that lets the grounded ice go faster. That creates faster shear on the sides. More stress being held up on the remaining ice, it broke. Once it broke, we've seen that unconstrained ice breaks off fairly quickly, probably sort of uh, Jeremy Bassus's work, so Bassus and Walker on the, the crevasses meeting from top and bottom, but it breaks off. Uh, with no ice shelf at all, the speed doubled or tripled. So this is the other observed well-known mechanism of getting rid of an ice shelf. And you do this from the ocean, not from the land. I, I will plug this one from our daughter, Karen, the smart one in the family. Um, ice streams all tend to have troughs at their surface. When they flow into the ocean, they get um, troughs in the base. 
Uh, that makes channels. Hot water goes up those. It melts up into them. It makes it really likely to break on the sides. So ice shelves are pretty much all preconditioned to do this. Um, and it may be happening, the Lair met at, at all paper in PNAS last year, it may be starting to happen. So, um, so yeah. yeah. It's almost certainly has happened a lot of times. Almost certainly has happened. I don't want to take you back for a moment to paleo. We were talking about Wally earlier and Gerard Bond and, and all these brilliant things and, and uh, Sidney Hemings work on these Heinrich events. So it, you, most of you know, if you go out in the North Atlantic and you drill a sediment core, the top of it will be shells of little forams. And then it will be a layer of pieces of the floor of Hudson Bay. Forams, Hudson Bay, forams, Hudson Bay. The Hudson Bay happened when the surface was cold and fresh and stable. Here is a, a contour map of one of these layers of pieces of the floor of Hudson Bay. You can see Greenland up there, and you can see Iceland over here and the Laurentide Ice Sheet. That's 40 centimeters. These things extend across the Atlantic and down to Portugal, um, which is sort of amazing. Uh, if you look at them, this would be uh, this. 4M shells, this would be the pieces of the floor of Hudson Bay. Um, it sort of looks like this. This would be shells, Hudson Bay, shells, Hudson Bay, shells, Hudson Bay. You know, this is, it, it's really an amazing sort of thing. Um, and, and what's going on, this is pretty clearly a Jakobsoffen ice shelf loss. Okay. So first thing, in cold times when there's an ice sheet, virtually all of the debris that is carried by glaciers is in the bottom because the snow is on top of everything else. Every ice shelf known is melting at the bottom. The coldest water, which is common in the world ocean, is made by brine rejection from sea ice formation. And that coldest water, when it gets to the grounding zone, is warm enough to melt because of the pressure dependence of the melting point. That means that an ice shelf is simply a filter to get rid of iceberg rafted debris. All of the debris or most of the debris melts out underneath because they're all melting. Sometimes there's so much melting that a little of it freezes back on later, but, but an ice shelf is a way to keep from having iceberg rafted debris. When you break off an ice shelf, then the icebergs can carry rocks out and drop them in the ocean. So a Heinrich event is a signal that the ice shelf broke. So how do you break an ice shelf? And so here's the Laurentide at a Heinrich event time with an ice shelf at a Heinrich event time. And normally, what did you have in the North Atlantic? You make cold water at the surface. That cold water ventilates to depth by sinking. And then you put one of these little freshwater caps on top and you stop the sinking in a place. What does that do? You're no longer ventilating mid-depth. And then something else is going to turn that towards what you have in the Arctic, for example, with warmer water at depth. So you start seeing warmer water show up at depth after you stabilize the system. What happened after that? The ice shelf broke off and you had a Heinrich event. This is not just Jakobshaven. It is not just maybe Pine Island. You really can kill an ice shelf by putting warm water under it. And that's not good news. So this is some work, um, you know, Bronsilier et al, you know, great people are working on this. And um, this is a modern Antarctic on your left. The isopegnals come to the surface offshore. The isopegnal mixing is bringing up warm circumpolar deep waters, primarily offshore. If you take too much mass out of the ice sheet, you freshen the surface and you put a lid on it, which can grow sea ice. That will help prevent a Larsen B. It may help prevent meltwater taking out the ice shelves. There's some, which comes first, the, the breakup or the, the, right. But at any rate, you may have seen papers that say, well, this is okay. 
we're going to be saved because when it starts to melt in Antarctica, it will cool itself off by putting a freshwater cap out there and then it won't keep melting. But if it does, it rolls the isopignals over and it hoses in. And what the Heinrich events say is that's not good. Okay. So we've got work to do on a lot of it. Let me take you back to, to Greenland. We'll fly in along the yellow arrow. We'll look at the, the ice flowing on the blue arrow. Um, this is what it looks like with the yellow arrow flying in and the blue arrow flowing towards you. I'll show you two pictures. Uh, there's one on the, with a seal. David Holland and company did oceanography with these things. It's just truly really amazing. Um, and then you get up to where the ice is, the cliff is, the seal's down here. The cliff's about 100 meters above it, sea level and 900 below. Um, scale, there's the Lincoln Memorial. There's the next photo along the cliff. Uh, there's the Lincoln Memorial. This is uh, about as high as you can get a cliff. It obviously is close to breaking. At the present, it breaks and then it waits a while and then it breaks. If it were higher, it might break faster. And there is published literature on that. Okay, so, so yeah. And when it breaks, you've probably seen these. Here's, here's the picture, uh, Martin Trufer and Mark Fonestock and Ian Jockin gave me these. There's the, the um, Lincoln Memorial for scale and there's a the hundred meter cliff and there's the iceberg breaking off. And you know, this is just amazing. It's a, that's a 50 story high splash. You know, we run it backwards, run it forward. These things are just really amazing. Um, okay, but like I say, now it breaks, it waits, it breaks, it waits, but if it could, could break faster in the future if it gets higher. Okay. Let's do that again, all right? Here is Glacier Bay in Alaska. Um, when Vancouver comes by in 1794, it's full of ice. John Muir, it's, it's stuck in the bottleneck. John Muir comes by in 1888, it's mostly open, right? So here's the map and, and um, Vancouver sees it right down here, stuck in the bottleneck. Muir sees it up here on this side and up here on this side, it's mostly open. I'm gonna take you to that little pink square, just that tiny little bit looking along the pink arrow. And this is what it looked like in 41 with the icebergs breaking off in the lower corner. Uh, nine years later, this is what it looked like. So this is nine years, same rock. Uh, this is a little later yet. That's just that little corner of this little tiny weenie drainage that doesn't mean much up in Alaska. John Muir made observations. Mark Meyer and Austin Post interpreted them. The glacier was breaking off at 11 kilometers a year. It thinned by about a mile up in the middle, not by flowing through the bottleneck, but by having the front break off so that the bottleneck essentially came to it. Everywhere that we know that ice flows into the ocean, there's a cliff. It's dominated by fracture. If it's cold in the air and the water, the cliff is at the end of the ice shelf. If it's warm everywhere, the ice shelves have been lost and the cliff is grounded, right? That's, and so fracture mechanics control this. All warm places, air or water, have lost their cliff and they're calving from a grounded front. Right? Nothing new there. There's pretty clearly a hysteresis. The Larson B broke off. There's been cooling after that, but it hasn't succeeded in making its ice shelf back again. It's trying sea ice, but um, the Jakobs oven broke off every winter practically. It tries to remake its ice shelf and then it breaks off again. Fluctuations and conditions haven't thrown it back. So it's pretty clearly easier to break off a shelf than it is to put it back. It's hysteresis. Modeling this is really hard, right? I, it's, it's fracture. And I took the broken things class at Wisconsin and the, the professor said, you know, build it, calculate the five significant figures and then build it three times stronger because you'll never get it right to a factor of two. Uh, fracture's hard, okay? We do not have any instrumental observations of a really serious collapse. We've seen the Larson B, we've seen Jakobsov and we haven't seen the Bentley Trench, right? We can use paleo, we have to use paleo, but recognize that the paleo warmth arrived over 10,000 years at an orbital cycle. 
it, it, paleo is necessary, but it may not be sufficient. And that's really worrisome to me. Um, so to the best I know, there is at present one attempt to include both ice shelf loss and calving cliff retreat. Okay. Guarantee you, if there's only one, that it's not the last word. <laughs> Okay, it's calibrated to the paleo, it's calibrated to the recent. Um, and what happens in this model, so this is DeCanto et al. and Pollard and DeCanto and what have you, what happens in this model is if we warm it enough to drive retreat of the weights, then West Antarctica deglaciates in the next century or so. Okay, and then more warming starts driving pieces of East Antarctica. So if we warm it enough in this model to trigger retreat of Thwaites, then the first approximation, Antarctica dominates everything afterwards and the other terms are small. Okay. Three meters or 11 feet in the next 100 years or so. Uh, this particular model limited the calving rates to uh, rates that have been exceeded in Greenland, a rate that was exceeded at Glacier Bay. Um, but it, it's not clear that that will be held in the future. Okay, so you could have perhaps a lot faster retreat in the Antarctic. To the best of my knowledge, no IPCC projection has ever included output from a model that included both ice shelf loss and calving cliff retreat for rise out to 2100. And if I'm wrong, I will apologize profusely. Um, the, the Pollard and the Canto stuff was not included out to 2100 in the SROC. Um, they undoubtedly go into the, the mental pictures of people doing expert elicitation. So they obviously are indirectly influencing what happens. But I do not believe that there's ever been a full ice sheet model that had both ice shelf loss and Kevin Cliff retreat uh, enabled and running and calibrated out in some way that was used in projecting the 2100 in the IPCC. Okay. I've spent a lot of time thinking about abrupt change. I, I chaired this one and I served on this one. I'll be honest, the biggest issues in climate change are not what we do anymore, right? It's social, economic, political. Uh, we can get together and solve problems, we can decide to shoot each other. And really, that's going to have a lot more influence on the future than anything I can ever learn as a glaciologist. Um, biological systems can have all sorts of funny things in them, you know, it gets too dry and it burns and it doesn't grow back. Uh, but I sort of kind of think that the single biggest physical tipping point is this that we can't find anything else that's bigger that's in, in the, the fully physical world than whether you retreat into those interior basins of West Antarctica. Uh, Dave Holland was one of the leaders in getting this going. There's, there's this uh, International Thwaites Glacier collaboration. There's a bunch of fantastic people who are doing the work who are on this right now. And hi to all of you and thank you. Um, this has been really hard in part because we lost two field seasons to the COVID. Um, this is hard because it is trying to predict fracture. And my understanding is it's still being done with what you would call core budgets at NSF, not initiative funding. Um, right. I'll show you just one thing and then I'm going to shut up because I just can't, can't not do this because it's so cool. This is a little picture of a piece of the bed of Thwaites Glacier. It came from Nick Holshue, Canute, you know, John Payton here. Um, this is part of this effort. Uh, 10 kilometers there. The topography here is 700 meters. Um, there's huge faults pretty clearly in this. This is what the bed really looks like. And we're pretty sure that we can tell you enough about the physics to tell you that this is a, the nature of the flow law controlling this is spatially variable at a pretty high frequency and that that has importance. We have two postage stamps of this resolution. This is, you know, ten, that 10 kilometer bar is a postage stamp compared to the ice sheet. Whether the ice pulls out of the bottleneck depends on the ocean, it depends on snowfall, it depends on isostasy, it depends on sea level, but it also depends on this. 
and we don't have the data to put this into the models to do this. It's it's really something. So so unsolicited opinion. Um, the people who are doing this are heroes. I will. If I were wearing a hat, I would tip it, but it's really a small effort compared to what it could mean. And so sea level rise with warming virtually guaranteed, heat melts ice, right? And, and warming ocean expands, that's virtually guaranteed. The IPCC models rely on, uh, they don't have ice shelf loss and calving cleft retreat. And so there is some possibility that they're perfectly correct and there's no problem at all. And there is some possibility that they're really low. That uncertainties are very heavily skewed, right? It's a little hard to have anything better than the IPCC. The IPCC may be completely right, but they may be well low. Okay? And trying to figure out more about this, I got to tell you, um, I'm not a social scientist. I'm not going to go figure out the economics. And, and so I, I think what years I have left to do this, this is the most exciting thing I can think of to work on, but I'm not gonna solve it. And I think we need a lot of work and a lot of help. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for what you're all doing. And I will more than happily take questions. Thank you very much, Ricky. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. Um, we have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. If you have a question, Please, uh, there are so many people uh, in, in, in this, so could you uh, perhaps raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you first and that avoids, you know, too many people talking at the same time. Um, so uh, the, the first questions in the chat are from uh, Vivian. Vivian, would you like to uh, unmute? It's always good to uh, hear from other people. Oh, yes. The, uh, this was earlier in the talk when uh, um, uh, we were discussing the uh, breakup of the Larson B, and I didn't really hear anything about hydrofracturing, and I thought that played an important role. That was the dominant role. So that that funny pattern on the surface of the ice shelf is the water standing in the in the crevasses in the lakes. So it was very clearly driven by hydrofracturing, and that's one of the reasons why it's difficult um, because there's just so many things that water can do. Um, I wrote a paper back in 05 with a bunch of great people on how lakes break through to the bottom of Greenland. And there's this competition between wedging open and freezing closed. But, but if you can drain into it in a fern aquifer and out of it in a fern aquifer, and you can make rivers on the surface the way Robin Bell and company there at, at Lamont have shown, and, and it's, it's a wonderful rich field, but too much water in the crack and it will fall apart. I, so, so I see people seem to be adding their questions to the chat, which is which is okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure about the circular um, feature, Vivian. Um, Gavin, I lost comic sand. Sorry. Um, reduction uh -huh. in the conveyor result in greater surface warming. So, um, so I'm not sure exact that that's exactly where I was headed. So, what happened in the north in the Heinrich events? Reduction in conveyor resulted in subsurface warming, and when you quit ventilating the mid depths by sinking from the surface, which is the modern pattern. You cool in the winter, you sink to the bottom, then the whole depth is, is ventilated. Um, when you quit that, something else will eventually come into the mid depths. And um, it sort of, it's not, I'm sure Arnold Gordon could, it's not exactly going to the Arctic Ocean, but it basically is. And you know, the Arctic Ocean has got this cold top, a cold halocline, and then it's got um, Atlantic water down below. And so think of that. And so in turn, if you capped the Southern Ocean in the future from melting Antarctica, you might expect something similar with rolling the isopegnals over and then the isopegnal mixing will put warm water at the grounding zones. Uh, thanks again. So that was a question from, from Ken. From Ken the, the next one is from Allegra. Yeah. Al Allegra, would you like to unmute perhaps? I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the uh, IPCC's one and a half degrees special report sea level rise. I, 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 if, are they being optimistic, pessimistic? Uh, 
Yeah. So, so my gut feeling is that in general, the work done there is really good. The, the atmospheric models, the surface mass, I mean, you know, they, you're informing them. Um, the uh, mass, what's going on there is really good. The, the response of the ice flow to mass balance changes is pretty good. The atmosphere is better and what have you, but, um, but the ice is pretty good. You know, you've got people on this talk who have built these models that are, that are doing well, as long as we avoid something crazy. And 1.5, there still are a couple of papers. So Ian Jockin had this paper in, when was it, 2014, that said we've already crossed the threshold for retreat of weights, that it's already doomed. Um, that got a lot of press. Uh, Byron had a paper in 2013 that said we may or may not have crossed the threshold, and it depends on the nature of the bed that I showed you that one picture of. He can put the bed one way or the other, and either we're already in trouble or we're not. Most of Rob and Dave's work says that 1.5 is okay. We haven't triggered the, the loss yet. And so I really do think it's sort of threshold crossing or else it's pretty good. And David, um, fantastic question there. So is fracture of ice independent strain rate only depends on failure stress. Um, most of the things say stress and strain rate matter. Um, that was the Clerk et al. Um, it's possible that, that Byron and, and Jeremy and, and company were too stable because they didn't include that. Um, <clears throat> the difficulty is mostly about what we can't easily observe. So you know the story, if I threw my um, coffee mug on a hard floor, it might break and it might chip and it might bounce and I can draw you a beautiful distribution, a probability density function of coffee cups breaking on a hard floor. Um, the physics are very well understood, but predicting one of them is almost impossible because I can't tell if there's a flaw right there under the glaze that got put in when it was cooling. And the question, is the ice fine-grained uniform? Are there little cracks in it? Are the bubbles connected by subgrade boundaries? Are there stratigraphic things that trap grain boundaries? Are there healed crevasses? Are there, you can put, you can dial a lot of hundreds of meters of difference in the thickness of stability based on things that we don't measure well. And I think we can do better. Um, but I think that's where the big problem is. Next, we have a question from uh, Kevin Schmidt, I yes. believe. Kevin, if you'd like to un unmute, sorry to pick on people, but it's, I think it's nice to hear us. Yeah, no, it's okay. Hi, hi, Richard. Hi, Kevin, uh, good to see you. I yeah, I have, I, have, I have two questions, one which I was just typing out and, and the other one which, which I already put in. So, uh, you know, I mean, lots of people have made a lot from the Deconto and Pollard mechanism. And, uh, you know, and, and if you think about this in terms of the sociology of model making, uh, you know, you start off with a model that's the best you can do and it, and it fails to match uh, a paleo situation. In their case, it was the EMU. Um, and, uh, and so it's not stable enough. And so, uh, and so you add something that makes it less stable, right? It was, it was too stable. So you add something that makes it less stable. And, you know, the one thing that they, they landed on was, was, this, was this particular uh, mechanism. Uh, and then it's got a knob on it and you can tune it and then you can say, okay, well, now I'm matching the EMU and now I can go forward, right? Um, but it's, uh, as, as you said earlier, there's a thousand different mechanisms that these models don't include, right? Um, issues with bedrock uh, um, uh, structure, um, you know, how much till there is underneath whatever, uh, you know, underneath the Laurentides, right? The, or, or underneath parts of Greenland, right? So, you, you, so we know that, that there are a lot of different things that one might have done to that model to get it to fit the EMU. 
and then we're being we're, we're being asked to 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 think. I mean, I mean, we're not really being asked to think, but but the but the question arises is what's the sensitivity of all those different mechanisms that could have prov provided just a good uh, match to the immune as they go forward into the future? Yeah. Right. And and I and I think you know the the the. I mean, this is another sociology question, right? I think the hesitancy in uh, taking the the, the Deconte and Pollard thing and saying, okay, well, this is our best guess, is in part because of well, they could have done a thousand different things that might have produced a thousand different answers going forward, and we don't really have a lot of confidence that the one that they chose is is either typical or uh, or, or or even plausible. I mean, it, it's it, that's a really big unknown question, right? Completely. So, so I mean, they did choose to add this in part because yours truly said, this is real physics, we've observed it, it has to exist under some conditions. And so they, they didn't add this just as a random kludge, they added it as something that's known physics. Well, but I mean, your the, point, I mean, regardless of what I just said, your right. point is completely correct. Okay, just nailed. Um, I mean, you know the story, right? If 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 Charney had had one model rather than two, he'd have gotten the wrong sensitivity. I think I could find a lot of Gavin Schmidt quotes in various places that you do not project the future with one model. You don't throw away all the other ones that don't work well. You don't take one as the best case or the worst case. You really actually celebrate the multi-model mean and you celebrate the fact that there's a lot of groups with a lot of models and different funding and different motivations and different histories that they're trying to defend. And when they come up with similar results, then you can look the public in the eye and say, this is actually might be pretty darn good. But, oh, taking one model that's been made to fit it and saying this is the best, this is the worst, this is the middle or anything else, I'm not comfortable with that. And I'm a co-author on, on a couple of the papers. I'm a small piece of a big thing. So I know exactly that I'm, I'm shooting myself. But having no models that do it, I don't, versus having one model, I'd be happier if we had 10 models that did it. And they had tried these other things. And they had looked at Mo's question about whether the EMEAN was only two to four rather than six or nine. Um, and that we had a, a much broader range of possibilities so that we can get away from having one model, which obviously had to there, so Dave and Rob's model has a viscous bed. Yeah. Viscous beds are really prone to retreat and then they're prone to really slow retreat. Um, plastic beds are not prone to retreat, but if they retreat, they go faster. The bed fairly clearly is viscous plastic, viscous plastic, viscous plastic. Um, broadly, nobody has that because we're still working. And Matt Mathieu has been helping our grad student who's trying to put that into their model. So, um, so th there's so many of these things out there, but which is why I don't think that we have really narrowed the uncertainty range on that upper end. I just don't think we've gotten there. And I don't think we're one IPCC away from doing it. Yeah. I hope we are. I hope that when 10 more people put this in their models that they either say, I can't make anything happen, we're home free, or, oh my goodness, I make things happen, we're not home free. Because one model sorta kinda, I mean, what I hope I was sorta saying, we have sharpened the hypothesis space a lot but it's still the hypothesis that I was taught when I showed up in 1977, which is there's a lot of ice where it doesn't want to be and it might go in a hurry. Thanks. And Mark, um, there is actually one paper out there, Mark, on, on geoengineering this. Um, the um, Somebody, and I should remember who, and I apologize, they need to be on. Um, if you could build a gymongous wall to keep the circumpolar deep water away from Thwaites, um, the biggest engineering project in history uh, under the most favorable assumptions in a much worse place might sort of almost kind of maybe help. Well, what I'm, I mean, as you know, because um, you have a colleague involved, there's all of this controversy about, you know, solar remediation, okay? So 
My take, and I'm wondering if this is correct, you see this is correct, is uh, if the issue is sea level rise, it's not going to help to much to do things at the top, at least not in the short run, or a short enough run, let's say. Is that how you see it, or uh, do you think it might actually hold back the ice? Right. So, so the the um, the hysteresis in this system is pretty strong, and so it's much easier to trigger a bad thing than it is to undo the bad thing. So, if you wait until bad things have been triggered and then use solar radiation management, you can regrow the mountain glaciers, you can regrow Greenland, you can eventually you can cool off the ocean, but it's going to be much harder to undo what the weights collapse if we do what the weights collapse, because there's a very strong hysteresis in it. So that either says, keep the CO2 out of the air, uh, get it out really fast, or um, what, you know, the, the, you, you could you could use this as an argument for very strong mitigation. You could use this as an argument for really early deployment. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't really want to go there. I'm sorry to say. Uh, it was John Moore. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. It was John Moore and company. Yes. Um, and Mo's point there is really important. And uh, Rob's point is really important. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Yeah. So, but this one raises the stakes because if it happens, so she's not sure, but if it happens with warming, once it's triggered, reversing it, it it's it's not impossible the ice sheet's there it grew right so it has to be reversible but it, once it's triggered the reverse is not just getting back the way you were on the path you were on it's pretty clear that there really is a hysteresis in this system and that means that sooner is better okay <laughs> Mathieu has put the the um geoengineering paper in the chat in case you're interested um <laughs> Liz's comment is very uh, apropos there. Um, I'm trying to see what else we were hitting. Um, so Bob Kopp is, is, of course, really important on there. Um, uh, and there is a, a two new papers out. And if you want to see, stay, come in tomorrow to Nature and have a look, because there's a new huge long paper from, from Rob DeCanto coming that is an extension of this and it answers a huge number of the questions, but it of course leaves a lot of questions to be asked. And then there's this brilliant, comprehensive, carefully done um, view of everything except collapsing ice cliffs, um, which gives much smaller rises and they are they're well quantified, they are carefully done, the statistics are good, you know. So you've got this, this wonderful, uh, actionable, um, well-constrained, well-boxed in, multi-model mean work. And then this one outlier that has the collapsing cliffs that under strong, under low warming looks almost identical. It's right in the picture. And under strong warming looks really different. See what else we got here. Um, yes. Um, we have a. Yes, comment Gavin's on comment on the Southern Ocean. Oh, yes, Gavin. <laughs> um, so, threshold global temperature uh, differential warming, including the Southern Ocean. It's, uh, I mean, Arnold Gordon. Uh, I had fascinating discussions with him on questions which are very closely related to this, Gavin, except for Ice Age things. And, and I bet you've had the same discussions. So um, if, if you, you know, I want to do ice sheets, I want to do ice sheets, and then I want to do ice sheets. But if I weren't doing ice sheets, I'd probably, and I were smart enough, I'd want to do the Southern Ocean. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, too. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, end, the point there is that th there may be some particularly special things that have happened in the Southern Ocean uh, in the historical period that mean that, um, yeah, you know, the, I mean, as you as you said, you know, maybe there are no analogs for this, right? You know, um, and that, and we are kind of flying blind, which is obviously more problematic. Yeah. I suspect it really is no analog at some some level. Um, 
it's and I, you know, and you know as well. There's this additional huge discussion about whether we should still have RCP 8.5 or whatever replaces it in our in our discussions because maybe we've fallen off of that and so on. And as we go to smaller forcing, things look better fairly clearly. Um, but no, I don't think nature has ever put as much heat over as much ice as RCP 8.5 would. So yeah, that's the no analog thing. Uh, I, yes, and Dave Porter, thank you. Yeah, Mike Wolovec was was in on that. That was that was thank you. I, I I will plead that I've been at this for forty four years, but I should have remembered that. So yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I believe uh, Liz Ulti. Ah. <laughs> yes, Liz. Uh, yeah, no, I was just raising the point that uh, this paper by Moore and Wolovig, and I think there's a third co-author as well, uh, talks about the physics of deploying a submarine wall, but there are some serious social considerations as well in terms of where you get labor to construct such a thing, how you're going to govern the deployment of uh, submarine walls, uh, where it's going to be funded by. Um, so I think there are a lot of embedded social science questions that it would do well not to forget about when we're thinking about the physical deployment of such interventions. Yes, I think the point is exceptionally well taken. My, my entirely uninformed amateur opinion is that, that mitigation, keeping the CO2 out of the air is, is really, really difficult, but it's a lot easier than a number of the other things that might be put in. And the question of a wall, the question of, um, yes, uh, Gavin, the proposed wall across the Gibraltar Straits, you know, the question of who's going to fly the 747s in the stratosphere and spray things out and, and who decides where the dial is set. Um, I'm glad I'm not responsible for negotiating that. So I, I don't want to end discussions here, but a, a few of us have uh, get on the guess end have to go to another meeting at the moment. Um, <laughs> You're doing but, work. <laughs> but uh, so maybe um, can I make you the um, sort of head of the Zoom, as it were, and I will sneak out to the next thing. And uh, if people want to continue asking questions, I think that would be that would be great. Um, thank thank, thank you again, again, Craig, Richard, for 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 agreeing to do this. It was a really wonderful talk. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have you do another one, maybe in, in real life at some point, if it's possible, if you're in the New York I, area. I hope I could talk science rather than than this big picture stuff, because oh dear, the the details, what some of these people are doing is spectacular. It's really fun. <laughs> okay, Doug. Thank you so much, and um, I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Uh, bye for now. Thank you all. A real pleasure. Hey. So happy to, to chat anything else. I surely don't want to keep anyone away from real work, but um, you know, if there's anything else we should chat about, why like, please do. Um, yes, indeed, Mark <laughs> and Matthew, thank you. Frank, thank you. A real pleasure. Yep. Baron, I don't think I even succeeded in getting your name up there. I surely should have, but <laughs> it's it's such a pleasure. Yes. Hey, Richard. When Richard. Wait, is that uh, my unmuted? Yeah. You know, one thing it, uh, it's interesting is, you know, there's so many parts of this network that interact with one another. But as SAM's Southern Annual Mode becomes more positive, it's changing the upwelling structure and the depth of the warm deep water uh, that might influence, get onto the shelf and melt the glacial ice. So that's another factor in a warming climate. You get a positive, strong positive SAM's which actually will increase the amount of heat going on under the ice shelves. Yes, I think David can chime in on this. I think that's probably the, of the many things that have been going on, that's probably the biggest one, isn't it, David? It's fast. Yeah. The ocean goes where the wind blows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's this bizarre thing that the first approximation, all change is bad for an ice sheet. 
right? Mm. Because what do they do? They Ice shelves love shelf waters. They love this brine rejected from sea ice. That's the coldest water. And so when you take a picture, normally you see ice shelves in shelf water. Anything that happens is either neutral or bad, right? There's nothing that you can't make it better. <laughs> it's just... Right. But it also it also could lead this process that can increase the melting might actually decrease Antarctic bottom water formation too. Yeah, <laughs> ventilation <laughs> of the deep ocean. It's really there's so many parts of this network of interactions. It's hard to isolate. We all take our favorite ones. Minus the Southern Ocean. <laughs> yeah. And of course, that eventually will go to Gavin's so that we actually need good models of all of these things. And I know. Right. So, so you, you have enough expertise there. How good really are the Southern Oceans now in the IPCC class models? Who are you asking? Me? <laughs> yeah, you or David, right? You can start. Well, the problem is, is that if you really got to get the continental margins right, which depend on the wind, because the ocean goes as the wind blows or something, <laughs> uh, and does it have the resolution to get that? Does it not only have the physics uh, processes right, but it has the spatial and temporal resolution too? I don't think they're very good, but okay, <laughs> but they're improving. Uh, and the last, the last report I saw, there was like twenty models, and they had the through flow in Drake Passage. And it went from twice as big as expected to actually one of them was a negative number. I don't know what that means. <laughs> that would be bad. Okay, I got to go. That was fantastic talk, Richard. Thank, thank, I better too, but it's a real pleasure. Gisela, thank you for coming. Richard, yeah. I have a quick, can I ask you a quick paleo of course. question? Um, you said something, you know, sort of like the paleo is not a good analogy because it works on these long orbital time scales. Is that really true? I mean, you know, if there is high energy events, they are not orbitally driven, right? So, so I hope what I said is paleo is necessary, but it may not it's, be sufficient. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that that's accurate. So, so it is true that oh. you know you tweak the 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 DO tweaks the Southern Ocean pretty hard and pretty fast. Um, and so, if it is if it is millennial, you know, but even there what the ocean signal shows up 200 years after and it's the winds change fast, but then the ocean changes over centuries, probably not, right? So you know that the north is a step and the south is a ramp. And so my suspicion is that it's hard to see steps in that. Yeah. Now, whether I, I mean, I agree in principle, you know, we, we have some, right, our, whole southern ocean view from paleo is very much atlantic driven yes and now and east antarctica right sort of dominated we now think we might have some records from we do we definitely do have records from the subantarctic south pacific that might tell us something about the west antarctic ice sheet yes um and if that yes Yes, and I think, you know, the, or sort of the conceptual thing, you know, that's why I was really intrigued by how you were describing it is there could be something like Heinrich events, you know, of the West Antarctic ice sheet that we just have never seen because we didn't have the records. Yes. And, and I, I, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a few papers on IRD. Um, there's a few others, Iceberg Alley, you know, that's strongly Atlantic centric and it's still the wrong ice sheet. There's a, it's the wrong ice sheet and there's, I, I hope I don't insult anyone. There's a lot of interpretation of a little data of a very fuzzy, IRD is a very fuzzy indicator. And it, you know, it's, if there's no ice and you make it cold, you get IRD. And then if you make it colder, you get less IRD. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, thank you very much. That was very, you know, cool. Thank you, yes. I right, let you guys do it. Uh, Richard, I had one last question for you. Yes. Um, so when we use the word tipping point in math or in the media, so just see where I, I get very confused here. So a tipping point, I could give it the uh, adjectives of it's sudden and it's irreversible. So it's, so it's a large sudden change and it's irreversible. So 
we have a climate now today and it's more might be a little bit warmer or a little bit less that's not really sudden and but there is this concept of tipping point so what does that word mean to you as in general speech and how would you share it and what does it mean to you when i write an equation and i said the equation this solution demonstrates the same information the same thinking right and and <laughs> You know, originally I worked hard on abrupt climate change and I didn't like using tipping point. I still don't um, because it's so, you know, how it is. So it's what you said, sudden and it's eerie. At least there's hysteresis, right? And you can't use that. Hysteresis, in public, yeah. But there's, there is yeah. a his, then the hysteresis matters. So it's not, if it's a really <laughs> narrow <laughs> envelope, <laughs> yeah, who right. cares? But no, so no. that the hysteresis matters, I think is is important. Um, and then, you know, after that, there's so many issues. So economically, if we melt the mountain glaciers, it's pretty clear that that's irreversible. But in a world with geoengineering or a world with CO2 removal, it's completely reversible. So, so mountain glacier melting and probably Arctic sea ice are geophysically, it's a pretty narrow hysteresis loop. Uh, socioeconomically, it's a big hysteresis loop. Um, ice sheets collapse, right? So, so Greenland melting is, is, is a moderate, hyster moderate hysteresis loop. It will do, it loses some ice shelves, it gets lower, but it's still pretty reversible. And so, so Greenland would be, you can pass a tipping point in Greenland if, you're following any of the RCPs, but in principle, it's not really a tipping point because we could we could geoengineer and then just draw it back. Um, West so, Antarctic so, collapse, so, so, yeah. right? So, 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 so then the tipping point has to be defined relative to how much forcing you can use to untip it, and is that we're continuing emissions, is that we're stabilizing, is that we're reducing, is that we're actually taking things out or blocking the sun, right? And so the, that, what is a tipping point in one of those is not a tipping point in another. And so I don't like Greenland tipping points, for example, because I think that's, you know, that we could easily take CO2 out and regrow Greenland mountain glaciers i don't like the tipping point we have passed the point of no return that glacier is doomed it probably is because we're not really going to read those co2 fast and so the great glacier will melt away but it's not and, okay it's, so yeah. right and so i like that i think what you're doing you're saying is tipping points can be small and big and it's the big ones that we're actually going to use that word with yeah that's sort of way I go, but but I don't know if, if that's right. So. <laughs> okay. Well, and so there's there's this, a separate thing which is um, associated with that word tipping point is as you said hysteresis, right? And the hysteresis, like you said, small or big. I totally get that. And where does it come in about the sudden? Now the word hysteresis does that imply sudden change? Because at, if you have a, a forcing line and a response, you're going along linear, say, but you could imagine a hysteresis diagram. Yeah. Is it the point where the hysteresis jumps? Is that a, is that is that a bifurcation, first of all? And right? And is that a sudden change? Is it just where the, the, the hysteresis curves come together and depart? Like what? Yeah. What do you think of those so, so, concepts? I mean, you probably have a better idea than I do, but I think that's a bifurcation. It's yeah. it, using that as a tipping point. One has to be careful because of the, you know, it's, it's the one I think of is downtown State College. When you pass a point, you have to go around the block because we have one way streets. And your <laughs> position on the GPS is smooth, but when you pass that bifurcation point, then you do have to go around the block. You, you can't come back, so you missed that, you have to go around the block. So is that a tipping point? Well, it is a tipping point for my future. I have now um, defined things that I can or can't do in the future based on that, but you didn't notice that. So there would be ones that it, 
you saw a sudden change. The, the Brazilian rainforest burned and then it doesn't grow back. That's a tipping point that's obvious. Do you want to call a bifurcation a tipping point? You've determined your future. You've determined there will be a big change relative to what you had intended, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, and let's just stick with that one for a second. So with that, so you arrived at the street corner and you made the smallest decision. And then there were two outcomes. Yes. And both are valid solutions. Both are valid solutions, right. So that's- but elsewhere. That's Elsewhere on your journey, small changes don't matter. Matter, no. So do we have, like when I run an ocean model for teaching, it has like the smallest, tiniest change and boom, the solution bifurcates. And is, is that math equation, it's just a math equation, but does nature have that? Yeah, well, and, and again, I think you know this better than I do. And you know the story, which is in simple models, it's fantastically easy to, demo, to make those. And in good models with appropriate diffusion, it's really hard to make those, but there's probably a very small number of cases where they exist, right? So I do, I do think that the younger Dryas ended in a rush. <laughs> Yeah, so that wouldn't, that there, there was something happened there in a hurry. But you know, people who built simple models of the ocean to try to do a Wally Broker, it was a piece of cake. You know, it's you, almost anything you do it. Goes, um, and then when you, you dial it up to be appropriate, it gets really special conditions before you generate that. And, and, does, does nature inherently possess these jumps and not the linear behavior? Right. My suspicion is that nature inherently just has these jumps in a very small number of very special cases. I think they're rare. So um, it's, you know, and I spent some time occasionally back when senators used to call when they were interested in these things. You'd get something on methane. There's going to be giant methane belches. And you say, come on. No, there's not going to be giant methane belches with really high confidence. And because nature doesn't like that. And so there's whenever you try to, to load up a spring and then pull the trigger, nature tends to diffuse it out. Nature tends to ease it out. Physical systems have a lot of diffusion and they have a lot of relaxation. And so you can make systems that have to, but there are landslides, there are earthquakes, there, the volcano erupts or it doesn't, these things happen. And those are, you know, boom, the, the dike freezes just before it breaks through or else it breaks through on the surface and there's more flow from below. <laughs> um, the lake freezes in the crack or else it breaks all the way through. Um, this is the reason that, that AGU still desperately loves earthquakes and volcanoes and landslides is that they're hard and interesting and they have tipping yeah. points in them. So they're dramatic, but everything else diffuses away, you know? <laughs> and, and so is, is what was snowball earth real? And I think, in yes. the really, and so in the really big picture, um, was that something that had two solutions, like same sun, but two solutions, ice free or? I think that that one is. I, I, I personally, I'm pretty convinced that there's a lot of evidence, and the I'm very taken with the cap carbonates on top. So you know the model is CO2 capped as warm. If you somehow could lower CO2, it's the thermostat's 100,000 years. So if you could make a fast break around it, you might drop into a snowball then you need a few million years of CO2. You have to see that CO2 turn to rock, and we do. And so I tend to think that that's real. Um, and so then it presumably is two solutions. And when I explain it to the, our class, what I tell them, which I hope is right, is that the rock weathering feedback is a really powerful stabilizer, but it's slow. 
And the, anyone who's ever played sports, the way you beat a really powerful defense is with a fast break. And so, and what was the fast break? I think it's a little whiff of O2 that took down some methane, but I don't think we know. That's, yeah, so that's interesting. So uh, yeah, so I just wanted to touch base on those topics because I hear people using them and then I notice I start to use them and I wanna be careful what am I saying? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're used consistently. I don't think we know what to do with them, um, really. And I think you have immediately shown that there's a taxonomy of these things. And the one word is serving different pieces of the taxonomy for different people at different times. Yeah. And that makes it really hard. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like me calling something a table and it says five meanings. It's like, but it's a table. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So how are you doing, David? Are things okay? okay. Yeah, so I'm in uh, isolation. I'm in Canada. Uh, so I'm in a, a cottage here. And uh, just share with you, I'm in a little village called Brigus. Can you see the harbor? Oh man. Oh, there, I'm jealous. Look at that. So, so this is where Bob Bartlett took um, Robert Perry to the North Pole from this harbor. Wow. So this is Brigus. And so this is where, this was famous for sealing. And okay. so um, Perry came up here to this. So Bartlett bought a ship here that he knew could get to the North, as far to the North Pole as possible up to, you know, Baffin Bay. And so Perry picked him because he was really good at it. He's, he's buried. His, grave is just beyond that house over there it's really amazing wow. to see bob bartlett and this is where it happened and then that whole story of of the comedy tragedy of the north pole yes yeah yeah like, so did i don't think perry ever made it did he i don't think so but oh you know, what do we say yeah and, and then the was this other guy cook who was the doctor who had dinner with Perry and then Cook said, I went there? <laughs> yeah, just it's, you know, you really doubt anybody of this. Yeah, I know. And then, and then Cook said he buried all his measurements of being at the North Pole under a cairn in Greenland. And so they were like, where's your notes? Like, where's all the measurements, astronomical measurements? He said, no, I left them under a rock. <laughs> it's like, oh. And so then, Perry and Bartlett went to that place. And so now we don't know if Perry and Bartlett found it and burned it or it was never there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But at any rate, it's great that you're there. Yeah, you, you probably know our daughter is now in Canada. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Have you taught her Canadian speech? Uh, no, I don't think we're quite there yet. <laughs> She's really, it's, you know, they're nice people and, and we're really happy that she's there and it will be, she's going to have to do more Canadian work. Um, so she's, you know, been okay. Antarctic centric and it's clear that they want to work on Canadian Arctic glaciers, but there's support, there's good people. It's, you know, she can bring in grad students. It's really wonderful. Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of government support for that activity. So I think she's going to uh, do well in that setting. Yeah, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. She's getting good work out already. And so this is all good. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so how are you doing yourself? Oh, you know, getting older and um we all a little are. <laughs> a little grumpy some days, but basically we're really good. <laughs> you know, it's it's we're we're in way better shape than we have any right to be. Um it's you know, I don't do anything anymore. And I, I talk to people and I help them write pay, edit papers and you know, I don't I never I haven't done things for years. And I I sometimes get grumpy that there's a lot of things being published and used that are not terribly good. Um, and, you mm. know, a lot of the defense of let's not worry about collapsing ice sheets is really bad. It's, um, and, and I don't quite know what to do with this. And, you know, Gavin Schmidt's question was completely right. You know, why would you believe one model? But the answer of, so let's not put it in any other models and then just deny that one model is just stupid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's really, that's what I see has happened for, for decades now that, that yeah. rather than deal with these huge difficulties, they write things and then throw them away. So, so 
DeCanto, DeCanto and Pollard is not in the S rock. Uh, why? Because warming arrived a little too early in the model. If they'd wanted to use the model, they could have taken all the results and shifted them 30 years. You know, so it's obvious they didn't want to deal with it. And yeah, but life is always surprising. Like when I was a grad student, I was studying Arctic sea ice. In 1993, not a human being on Earth would have said Arctic sea ice will decline. Is my memory. Yeah. So, and, so and yeah, then, you're completely right. But and then it all fell, yeah. fell apart. I'm afraid we've lost a lot of time. It's still, and, and I'll be blunt, it still just pisses me off from beyond belief that you put so much effort and Sridhar and a small number of other people to make Thwaites happen. And th there's no recognition of that. They were just proposals that didn't get funded. And uh, I'm uh, sorry, uh, I, I pissed off beyond belief. Pissed. Yeah, I, I, I'm on the same page with you. Because <laughs> <laughs> you had it, you had it. And, and, and to be honest, you know, I think I've told you this story that I talked to a very high NSF official who I can't name, who I respect and who I trust, who said, mm -hmm. look, the, they were not going to get funded no matter what the reviews were because we couldn't do it. And... I'm sorry, yeah. but this person year in that, that, that didn't, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's not a, not a pretty story, but what yeah. you put together, you'll never get credit for it, but you did it and it's happening and it, it might actually work, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then none of the planning, nobody in a, none of our documents, we did, we write down a COVID plan. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Isn't that unbelievable? That happened like boom. Yes, and, and two years, and whether we get the third one, really, um, you know, it's it's just yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's any fuel left in Antarctica now. Yeah. So that's the the second year is just getting the fuel back in. So you know, yeah. it's it's gone. So yeah, it's just ugly. Um, right. And I just had a, a, um, a memory just a second. I was trying to think the first time I met you. And I think it was at a place called, there was a conference called Snowbird and a, a location called Snowbird, I think it was in Utah. And you gave a talk about, um, I think it was about the Greenland ice sheet and it might've been about your book, but I remember you had the picture and there was a toilet on the ice sheet. <laughs> that is, is that it? Yep. Yes. Wow. So that, so that was 1993. So where does the time go? I don't know, David. I just don't know. It's, it's. But I got to tell you, I actually was. You know, to see you and see some of those other people on the Zoom today, it, it, it's nice. It, it's, it's. Yeah. We've been isolated too long. I would, yeah. I would give a huge amount to be up there right now and buy you a beer. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really would. I would love to be there too. Well, yeah. uh, I really enjoyed the talk and uh, I think everyone else did. And it was also nice because I, I had this memory map in my head about how we got from the beginning to now. And it's it's consistent with what you said. So that made me feel good that. Thank you. Thank you. Because <laughs> it's, it's just flabbergasting. I mean, you know, we were, we had this detour, right? So, so my money came from Dome C when I got to Ohio State and there was money from Dome C because they had shot down that Herc with its Jado bomb, right? So there was that <laughs> parking lot of planes up there at Dome C and everyone was doing nothing thinking about West Antarctica and how can we get out of Dome C and go do something fun, you know? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> you can't make it up, it just is. You can't make it up. <laughs> hey, I got a call. Be well, David, it's a pleasure, thank you. Wonderful talk, thank you, take care. Take care, bye.